Hello, everybody. My name is Patrick, here with my beloved wife, Donna Lee. Hi. And today, we're going to look at a prophecy in chapter 9 of the book of Daniel, where the scripture uses the expression 70 weeks. Some translations, such as the NIV, say 77s, because the word here translated weeks can also be translated sevens. But whether we go with weeks or sevens, that will have no bearing on the outcome of our study. This prophecy gathers into itself an enormous amount of biblical knowledge, which could be more fully covered in a three-hour seminar or even a full-length book. In this video, we're going to identify the key observations in Scripture by which we can establish a big-picture look at what is revealed in this prophecy. Our knowledge needs to depend on what the Scripture itself is saying, not on what a teacher is saying about the Scriptures. So we're going to look at a lot of verses and give careful attention to how they connect with each other. We want to begin by reading verse 24 of Daniel chapter 9, which sets a framework for building our understanding of what is meant by this expression, 70 weeks. Verse 24 reads, my beloved. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgressions, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Thank you, honey. Just a brief survey of this verse with its statements about making reconciliation for iniquity and bringing in everlasting righteousness, we can see it pointing us to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He alone made reconciliation and brings everlasting righteousness to all who believe and repent, who will repent and believe in him. Mm -hmm. Jesus himself said in John chapter 5, verse 39, quote, You search the scriptures, and these are they which testify of me. Wherever we go in the scriptures, if we're not learning something about Jesus Christ and what we inherit by believing in him and what it means to be found outside of him, then we're missing the mm -hmm. point. So we're approaching the study of this prophecy with the gospel of Jesus Christ as our constant frame of reference. If we could turn to a prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11, where Jeremiah, around the year 605 BC, prophesies of a judgment on Jerusalem and its surrounding regions by the army of Babylon, the verse reads, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. By comparing this with other verses, such as Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10, we're able to see that God has spoken through the prophet to warn the people that Jerusalem will be destroyed by the Babylonians and the people taken captive into exile for 70 years. This destruction and exile would come as a punishment for the sustained disobedience of the nation in general. But Jeremiah was not the first to warn Israel about an exile in consequence of disobedience. Nine centuries earlier, the Lord had warned through Moses of the same thing. In the book of, book of Leviticus, chapter 26, we can read this warning of a future exile. The passage is long, so we'll read just a selection of verses that capture the main points relevant to our study on the 70 weeks, starting with verses 27 and 28. And after all this, if you do not obey me and walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you and furry. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. So here's an example of the use of a number that cannot be quantified on the human side. And there are many instances of this in the Bible. Whenever it's reasonable, we want to understand the use of a number in its literal sense. Mm -hmm. But there are instances when this is not reasonable, so that a number in certain contexts is better understood in a figurative or spiritual sense. Now, having read God's warning of a furious chastisement for sustained disobedience, let's go on to verses 32 through 35, which read, I will bring the land to desolation, and your enemies who dwell in it shall be astonished at it. I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbath as long as it lays in desolate, and you are in your enemy's land. Then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbath. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest. 
for the time it did not rest on your Sabbath when you dwelt in it. So here in Leviticus, God used the same expressions of desolation and astonishment in reference to the experience of exile. Prophecy cannot be broken. And we can see by direct observation how the oracle of Moses held through the centuries until God brought it to pass in the days of Jeremiah. Also, let's note this repeated reference to the land enjoying its Sabbaths during the time of exile, as this will connect deeply to our understanding of the 70 weeks. Let's go on to verse 43, which reads, The land also shall be left empty by them, and will enjoy its Sabbaths while it lays in desolate without them. They will accept their guilt, because they despise my judgments, and because their soul harbored my statues. This is interesting, how God had warned the nation before they even entered the land that there would be an exile in which the people would accept their guilt and the land would enjoy its Sabbath. But the prophecies of Moses do not tell us the length of the exile. That knowledge will not come until the revelation given through Jeremiah. But in this passage from Leviticus, I want to bring emphasis to how the exile would not only be a, a time of the acceptance of guilt, but also for the land to enjoy its Sabbaths. As the verse said, quote, Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate, and you are in your enemy's land, for the time it did not rest on your Sabbaths when you dwelt in it. The, this verse indicates how the people would fail to observe a required Sabbath rest for the land and that the years of exile would be a continual Sabbath for the land. This observation will come back around to hope in our understanding of how the exile foreshadowed the sufferings of Christ and how this connects to the prophecy of the 70 weeks. But what is the meaning of this reference to the land enjoying its Sabbaths? And why is this important? Among Christians, it is commonly known that under the Old Covenant, the people were commanded to observe a weekly seventh-day Sabbath and that each year, starting from Passover, they were to count seven weekly Sabbaths before celebrating the Feast of Weeks, which the New Testament calls Pentecost, a Greek word meaning 50. Christ was sacrificed on the Passover, and the Holy Spirit was given on Pentecost. But along with a weekly seventh-day Sabbath, the Israel was also commanded to observe a seventh-year Sabbath, a year of rest for the land, with no agricultural work at all. We can read about this in Leviticus chapter 25, verses 2 through 5, where God says to Moses, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, but in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your field or prune your vineyard, for it is a year of rest for the land. As we go forward in our study, let's keep in mind this command of a seventh-year Sabbath and how the exile will be a time in which the land enjoys a perpetual Sabbath rest. But there was another crucial feature to the land's Sabbath observance, which we can read about in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant release of debts. Every creditor who has lent anything to his neighbor shall release it. He shall not require it of his neighbor or his brother because it is called the Lord's release. So the seventh year Sabbath was to be a year of rest for the land and a time in which the debts of all Israelites were to be remitted. And just as the people counted seven weekly Sabbaths for 49 days followed by Pentecost, they were also to count seven land Sabbaths for 49 years and to then observe a very special year called the Jubilee. Let's go back to chapter 25 of Leviticus and note how there were four major blessings in the Jubilee observance. Liberty, rest, remission of debts, and restoration of lost inheritance. Let's start with verses 10 and 11. And you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. The, that 50th year shall be a jubilee to you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap. 
there is no record of Israel having ever observed the Jubilee or even the seventh year Sabbath. But in the commandment, we can see foreshadowings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Along with rest and release from debt, each Israelite who had come upon hard times and sold his land or a house or an orchard or a well, which he had received by inheritance, it was to be returned to him. And any Israelite who had sold himself into servitude was to be granted liberty to return to his family. So let's continue with a brief selection from verses 24 through 54. And in all the land of your possession, you shall grant redemption of the land. If one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possession, he may return to his possession. And if one of your, of your brethren who dwells by you becomes poor and sells himself to you, he shall serve you until the year of Jubilee. Then he shall be released in the year of Jubilee, he and his children with him. From this brief reading on the Jubilee, we can identify those four distinct foreshadowings of God's salvation in Christ. Liberty, rest, remission, restoration. Having made these observations on the seventh year Sabbath and the Jubilee, and how the exile would be a time for the land to enjoy its Sabbath while the people accepted their guilt, let's take this knowledge and apply it to a reading from Jeremiah chapter 52, which records the historical fulfillment of the prophesied exile, starting with verse 12. Now, in the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, who served the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. Great reading, honey. There's some tough words there. <laughs> By having this information on the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, historians can pin down the exact year on the calendar, 586 B.C., on the calendar we use. With that in mind, let's read verses 13 and 14. He burned the houses of the Lord and the king's house, all the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great. He burnt with fire, and all the army of the Chaldeans who were in who were with the captain of the guards, broke down all the walls of Jerusalem all around. The prophesied destruction had come to pass. Verse 3 of the chapter tells us that, quote, because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and Judah till he finally cast them out from his presence. Mm -hmm. Let's compare this with a statement in verse 27, quote, thus Judah was carried away captive from its own land. The exile had begun. And here we need to pause and fill in a gap in what we have observed about the land. The Old Testament is loaded up with historical copies foreshadowing greater and eternal realities ushered in with the coming of Christ and his triumph. For example, there was the exodus from Egypt, a release from physical bondage that did not deliver anyone from the guilt and power of sin, but it foreshadowed the release in Christ from spiritual bondage. Also, there was the physical circumcision, a ritual cutting off of the foreskin, which brought no one closer to God, but it foreshadowed the act of God in cutting off from us an identity in sin through repentance and faith in Christ. You can read about this in Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, among other places. And there are many other examples of Old Testament events, institutions, and observances, serving as types and copies of what God would accomplish in Christ. Now, having made these points, let's briefly look at what the scriptures tell us about what was foreshadowed in the earthly homeland of the bloodline descendants of Abraham, that is the land of Canaan. This is not the place for a fully developed study on this point, but we need to establish a baseline of observations to secure our knowledge of what the earthly homeland symbolized and foreshadowed. Over the next few minutes, this could seem like I'm getting a little off track, but these observations on the homeland will be crucial for opening our understanding of the 70 weeks prophecy. After the death of Solomon in 920 BC, the kingdom that had been unified under David split into two. The 10 breakaway tribes that formed the Northern Kingdom were headquartered in Samaria and collectively called the Kingdom of Israel. This could seem confusing since all of the 12 tribes were Israelites, but the coalition of tribes that formed the northern kingdom took to themselves the name Israel. 
the southern kingdom, consisting of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, with Jerusalem as its capital, was thereafter called the kingdom of Judah. And from this came the word Jew, a hyphenated form of the word Judah. The northern kingdom quickly became apostate and in the year 722 was conquered by a superpower called Assyria. This is described in 2 Kings chapter 17 where the 18th verse tells us, Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah alone. To be removed from the land was to be removed from God's sight, as verse 23 helps us to see again when it says, quote, The Lord removed Israel out of its sight, so Israel was carried away from their own land to Assyria. To be exiled from the land was to be removed from God's sight. We know that God is omnipresent, but in a special way, his eye was on the land of Canaan, in a particular, on the city of Jerusalem and its temple mount. A little more than a century later, the Babylonians did to Judah what the Assyrians had done to Israel. 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 20 tells us that, Because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and in Judea, that he finally cast them out from his presence. The Jewish homeland served as a type of the place of God's dwelling in heaven, so that when the Babylonians destroyed the city and the temple in 586 B.C., the scripture in Lamentations chapter 2, verse 1 says, quote, God cast down from heaven to the earth the beauty of Israel. The exile of the people from Jerusalem was figuratively a casting away from the presence of God, recapitulating the casting of Adam and Eve from the garden, from the time of that expulsion from the garden, humankind has been in a condition of spiritual exile from God, desperately in need of a reconciliation, of a return from the exile to sonship in God's presence by the putting away of sin and its curse. All of this is going to connect with the prophecy of the 70 weeks for a decisive insight on the meaning of that number. Again, both the exile and the return of Israel to its homeland serve as a type of the exile of humankind and our reconciliation to sonship with God through the curse-bearing sacrifice of Christ. This big-picture knowledge of the meaning of Israel's exile and the promise of return is captured powerfully by a comparison of verses from Isaiah and Romans. The prophet Isaiah, after prophesying of the exile, said the following about the return in chapter 10, verse 22 of Isaiah. For though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of them will return. In this prophecy, quote, the remnant will return. Please note this. We could think the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy was in the return of the Jewish people to the homeland of Judah and Jerusalem. And in fact, they did return to the homeland. But the greater fulfillment of that prophecy is explained in Romans chapter 9, verse 27, where the scripture quotes the verse from Isaiah, but unpackages the spiritual meaning, the spiritual and eternal meaning of that oracle. In this verse from Romans, note how Isaiah's prophecy that a remnant will return is restated as, quote, the remnant will be saved. Reading now from verse 27 of Romans chapter 9. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. The return to the earthly homeland, which did nothing to help the people in their relationship with God, foreshadowed our return to God through the reconciliation accomplished in Christ. This is the greater fulfillment foreshadowed in the earthly return. So with these observations on the spiritual meaning of the earthly homeland, let's package this with all we have observed about the exile and the time of Sabbath rest for the land, while the people accept their guilt. By way of review, we have carefully observed how the seventh year Sabbath was to be a time of rest for the land, and the exile a time in which the land enjoyed its Sabbaths while the people accepted their guilt. Moses had prophesied of this, but it was not until the days of Jeremiah that the length of the exile was revealed. Finally, after many centuries of national disobedience, in 586 B.C., 
Jerusalem was destroyed, and the people taken captive into exile in Babylon. With all of this on the table, let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 19 through 21, which speaks of Jerusalem's destruction and provides decisive knowledge on our subject. The passage reads, Then they burned the house of God, broke down the walls of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious possessions, and those who escaped from the sword the king of Babylon carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons, unto the rule of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, unto the land has enjoyed its Sabbath, as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Here is our insight. Each year of the 70-year exile was counted by God as a seventh-year Sabbath. As in the verse we just read, quote, As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Whereas the Jubilee granted a release from servitude and restoration of inheritance after seven of the seventh-year Sabbaths, the exile was a time of 70 seventh-year Sabbaths. Here is our 70 sevens, a number for the spiritual meaning of the 70-year exile, in which the land enjoyed 70 years of Sabbath rest while the people accepted their guilt. And what we're going to see now is how the exile and the return foreshadow the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Remember the first verse we read in this study, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, the only place in the Bible where the expression 70 weeks is mentioned. That verse established a framework for building our knowledge of the prophecy by connecting it to accomplishments that only the Christ could make, such as making an end of sin, making reconciliation for iniquity, and bringing in everlasting righteousness. Although the prophecy involved a return of the Jewish people to their homeland after the fall of Babylon, this return to Jerusalem served as a foreshadowing of the greater meaning of the prophecy, the return of repentant sinners to God through the salvation accomplished in Christ. In the exile of Israel, God counted the 70 years as sufficient atonement for centuries of sin in the homeland. None of this had any spiritual substance in itself. Its value was in what it pointed to. When the Messiah came, he, he suffered exile on the cross. When he accepted our guilt, crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God counted the sacrifice of one man as sufficient atonement for the lifetimes of sin for all who repent and believe in him. Through his atoning sacrifice, we have entered the jubilee of eternal liberty, rest, remittance of debt, and restoration of inheritance. This is the spiritual substance foreshadowed in the exile and return. This is the meaning of the 70 weeks. Daniel had prayed for a return to the homeland on an earth that will perish, and he was told his request had been granted. But the answer to his prayer involved exceedingly abundantly above all that he could ask or think. Uh, Ephesians 3.20 The people went back to a homeland where they continued displeasing God as the books of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi make abundantly clear along with Nehemiah and Ezra. When the Messiah did appear, quote, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. John 1, 10 or 11. The return did nothing to help the people spiritually, but it foreshadowed our return to God through the curse-bearing sacrifice of Christ, who made reconciliation for iniquity and brought in everlasting righteousness. Any understanding of the 70 weeks prophecy that misses this point is a profound failure of knowledge. With all of these observations in place, let's go now to Daniel chapter 9. In the first three verses, Daniel tells us that he received this prophecy in the first year after the combined armies of the Medes and the Persians had conquered Babylon. This was the year 538 B.C. And the verses read, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year 
of his reign. I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make a request by my prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. These verses give us the year in which Daniel brought his petition to God. Verse 1 tells us it was the first year of Darius the Mede, which was 539 or 538 B.C. Remember that Babylon was conquered by the Medes and the Persians, and the great Persian king at that time was Cyrus. In fact, many historians believe, for seemingly good reasons, that Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Persian are different titles for the same person. Other historians believe Cyrus and Darius shared a co-regency. Whatever the case on that, whether it was a co-regency or whether these are different names for the same person, no historian would dispute that the first year of Darius the Mede was the same calendar year as the first year of Cyrus the Persian. Now, why is this important? Because almost two centuries earlier, the prophet Isaiah had foretold by name the king who would command the release of the captives and the rebuilding of Jerusalem and its temple. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28, records God saying, Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple your foundation, your foundation shall be laid. The wording of the prophecy is explicit. Cyrus will say to Jerusalem, quote, you shall be built, and to the temple, quote, your foundation shall be laid. Let's compare this with verse 13 of the next chapter in Isaiah, where God, speaking again of Cyrus, says, I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city and let my exiles go free, not for price nor reward, says the Lord God of hosts. These prophecies of Isaiah identify three specific things for which Cyrus would give the command. The release of the exiles, a rebuilding of the city, the re rebuilding of the temple. The wording is explicit and prophecy cannot be broken. Isaiah had prophesied that Cyrus would do the very thing for which Daniel is going to pray. But before coming back to Daniel chapter 9, let's look again at 2 Chronicles chapter 36, now in verses 22 and 23, to see when the prophecy about Cyrus was fulfilled. The verses read, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is among you of all his people. May the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. These verses provide historical information to confirm that Cyrus, in the first year after the Medes and the Persians conquered Babylon, gave the command which Isaiah had prophesied Cyrus would give. You, we could read more about this in the first chapter of Ezra, but now we want to go back to Daniel chapter 9. Remember that after Daniel had read the prophecy of Jeremiah concerning the length of the exile, he went into a fast and began to pray. Since the prayer is lengthy, we're going to read a selection of verses to capture the main points, starting with verses 5, 10, and 11, which read, We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, our God, to walk in his laws. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against God. In this prayer, Daniel makes reference to the prophecy of Moses, 
about an exile in which the land would enjoy its Sabbaths while the people accepted their guilt. He stands in the gap on behalf of the people to confess sin and accept guilt. But Daniel also brought specific requests to God. And what we'll read in verses 16 through 19 is crucial to our study. The verses read, O oh Lord, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach. Now therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Daniel petitioned God for the release of the captives to return and build Jerusalem and its temple. This is what he prayed for in the first year of Darius the Mede, the same calendar year as the first year of Cyrus the Persian, whom Isaiah had prophesied would give the command for the very thing Daniel was asking. What happened next is recorded in verses 20 through 23 of Dan where Daniel explains. Now, while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in a vision at the beginning, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill and understand. At the beginning of your supplication, the command went out. And I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Two verses later, in verse 25, Gabriel tells Daniel that, quote, from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, end quote. These verses tell us that at the beginning of Daniel's prayer, quote, the command went out, the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Daniel was praying for what Isaiah had prophesied that Cyrus would do, and he is told by the angel that at the beginning of your supplications, the command went out. This information stares us in the face and grounds our knowledge of the year in which the command was given. Then we are told that, quote, 7 and 62 of the 70 weeks concern the time of the command until the death of Messiah. Let's take this fact with us into a full reading of verses 25 and 26 of Daniel chapter 9. Now therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troubled times. And after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city in the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, and till the end of the war, desolation are determined." Now, given all that we have looked at and lining it up with the immediate context of this passage, why would any Christian want to deny that the command to restore and build Jerusalem went out in the first year of Darius? The knowledge is transparent and can only be denied by doing violence to the context of the passage itself. Daniel made his prayer in 538 B.C., and the Messiah was killed most likely in the year AD 30, or somewhere very close to that. Almost 600 years stand between the going forth of the command and the death of Christ. Given this observation of the calendar years involved, to think of the 70 weeks as a literal number does not fit the context. 
if we insist the 70 weeks is a literal calendar counting number, it adds up to about one year and four months. In spite of this, there is a school of theology which builds its entire interpretation of the 70 weeks on a claim that it is a literal count calendar counting number. First, I need to say that the school of theology in which this interpretation was created is called dispensationalism. It is called this because its approach to studying scripture is based on dividing the Bible into seven compartments which it calls dispensations. In each of these compartments, God has a specific arrangement or plan for the people of that time, such as his arrangement for Israel under the Old Covenant from Moses until the death of Christ. For our purposes in this study, all that needs to be said about dispensationalism is that this is the theology behind the popular Left Behind series of books and movies, an entertaining series of stories set in the time of a seven-year tribulation between the rapture of the church and the bodily return of Christ. Having explained that, <clears throat> let's come back to the question of how dispensational teachers can make the time between the giving of the command and the death of Christ come out to be 69 weeks, 7 and 62 weeks. Since the entire Left Behind series hangs on this, we will look at what needs to be done for the 70 weeks prophecy to line up with the Left Behind teaching. Dispensational teachers begin by forcing on the number and idea that each week refers to a seven-year period. They justify this by citing two instances in Scripture where God used a calendar day to count for a year, such as in Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6, and in the book of Numbers chapter 14, verse 40, 34 or 44. From this, they claim that a day in Bible prophecy actually refers to a year, so that a week refers to seven years. <clears throat> this idea becomes awkward when we consider that Jesus prophesied he would spend three days in the grave, and none of us believe that by this, he really meant he would spend three years in the grave. So we can't make the day for a year instances in Ezekiel and Numbers a rule for Bible prophecy. But in the case of the 70 weeks, we have to at least consider it as a possibility. If we take this approach, our first problem is that in those instances just mentioned uh, from, from Ezekiel and Numbers, God explicitly stated he would count each day for a year, whereas in the passage of the 70 weeks, there is nothing mentioned about this. We can still think of it as a possibility, but when we look at the passage itself, there's really nothing there to give strength to the idea. And plus, it's no longer a literal number if each week stands for seven years. However, since many Christian pastors and commentators build their interpretation of the 70 weeks on the idea that each of the weeks represents a seven-year period, Let's go along with that idea and see where it leads. On the assumption of each week being a seven-year period, the seven and 62 weeks in verse 25 adds up to 483 years, 69 times seven, which is far short of what is needed to fill the time from the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the death of Messiah. To resolve this problem, dispensational teachers simply deny that the command to restore and build Jerusalem, as explained by Gabriel in verse 25, was the command given by Cyrus. Given all that we have looked at in this study, lining up our observations in Scripture from the books of Jeremiah, Leviticus, Isaiah, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, and the immediate context of Daniel chapter 9, how do dispensational teachers justify rejecting the first year of Darius as the year in which the command went out? Their, resp their response is to insist that the 70 weeks must be regarded as a literal number so that everything else in the passage must conform to this literal understanding of 70 weeks. Remember that by the dispensational reckoning, the 7 and 62 weeks from the command until the death of Messiah is 483 years. This means that if the command went out in the first year of Darius, it would destroy any possibility of the 70 weeks being a literal number, since almost 600 years passed from Cyrus's command until the death of Christ. <clears throat>
So, in, in dispensational theology, the immediate context of the passage is set aside, and the going forth of the command is transferred to a century later, in 445 B.C., that was the year, as we can read in Nehemiah chapter 2, when Nehemiah petitioned the Persian king Artaxerxes for permission to build the walls of Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. along with the house for himself and one other structure. This, according to dispensational teaching, was the command Gabriel referred to when speaking to Daniel a century earlier. Along with violating the context of the Daniel 9 passage, it's important to note that the authorization which Nehemiah received from Artaxerxes had nothing to do with the temple, which had long since been rebuilt, or with the release of the captives, who had been allowed to return a century earlier, or even with the rebuilding of the city in general, since those who returned from Babylon after the command of Cyrus had built houses, started businesses, and set up an economy based on agriculture, craftwork, and trade. The book of Nehemiah itself records this, along with the books of Haggai and Zechariah. Jerusalem was shoddy, and its walls had not been rebuilt, but it was a functioning city with a governing structure and a population of working citizens. Basically, all that was done in the days of Nehemiah was the rebuilding of the walls and a short-lived spiritual and social reform. Nehemiah went to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls, not to rebuild the city. A simple way of verifying this is by reading the 8th verse of chapter 2 of Nehemiah, showing this transfer of the command from the first year of Darius to the time of Nehemiah stands on very shaky ground. But even if we go along with this and grant that the 70 weeks to have begun in 445 BC, we still have a big problem. The number of years from 445 until the death of Christ is almost 10 years short of the 483 years required by the dispensational approach. So, what has to be done next in order to keep the theology of the left-behind stories from falling apart is something a majority of Christians are likely unaware of. What I'm about to share could seem incredible to a lot of viewers, but all of this is easy to verify. The first step here is for the dispensational teacher to claim the Israelites in the time of Daniel used a lunar calendar of 360 days per year. While it's true that they did use a lunar calendar, the one they received in Babylon, it's not possible for a lunar calendar to have 360 days in a year. A lunar month alternates between 29 and 30 days, so that a 12-month lunar year will range between 354 and 355 days. Since this is more than 10 days short of an actual year, to keep the calendar from spiraling out of sync with the seasons and the holy days, such as Passover, the Israelites would add a 13th month every two or three years. In the ancient world, there were calendar systems based on a flat counting of 12 30-day months with a 13th month added as needed. This resulted in a 360-day year, such as we see referred to in the days of Noah and other places in the Bible. But that is not the calendar used by the Israelites in the days of Daniel or at any time thereafter. So, right from the outset, we have an embarrassing claim by Christian scholars who think the Israelites used a lunar calendar with 360 day years. The fact is that they did not, and this can easily be verified. But once again, let's go along with the dispensational approach and see where it leads. In summary review so far, we have noted how the dispensationalist commentators set aside the context of the 70 week passage and transfer the command to rebuild Jerusalem from the time of Daniel to a century later, after first forcing on the passage the idea that each week symbolizes a seven year period, while at the same time insisting on a literal reading of the number, a contradiction from the outset. We have seen that even if we go along with these arbitrary impositions on the passage, we still have a problem of being about 10 years short of the required 483 years between the command to rebuild the city and the death of Messiah. This brought us to the claim that the Israelites in the time of Daniel used a lunar calendar that had 12 30-day months for a 360-day year, although this is untrue historically and impossible astronomically. 
let's go forward to the next step of the standard dispensational process, since the entire Left Behind series hangs on this in terms of its integrity. Remember that the dispensational commentator needs to have 483 years between the command to build Jerusalem and the death of Christ. But even after transferring the start date from the time to the time of Nehemiah, if we count the years from 445 BC to a reasonable date for the death of Jesus, we still come up short. The most common dispensational approach at this point is to push the estimated year of the Lord's crucifixion out to AD 33, which mean, would mean he was almost 40 years old. But even this comes out to only 477 years, six years short of what is required if we are to accept the 70 weeks as a, quote, literal number. So what the commentator does next is to point out that a 360-day year is a little more than five days short of an actual year. So he tells us, we have to go back and pick up the five days that were lost in each of the 477 years after multiplying 477 by five to come up with 2,385 days, he switches to a solar calendar and divides the 2,385 by 365, which comes to a little more than six and a half years. And of course, he rounds this off to six so he can add it to the 477 and come up with 483 years. Bingo, the dispensational scholar has made it work. But all of this raises the question, what it is that drives a dispensational teacher to perform such extreme hermeneutical gymnastics? What compels him to resist the transparent witness of Scripture and that the command to rebuild Jerusalem went out in the first year of Darius, meaning the 70 weeks could not possibly be a literal calendar counting number? What is at stake here for dispensational theology? The answer is the 70-year tribulation. Very few Christians seem to be aware that this is the only passage in the Bible from which the doctrine of a seven-year tribulation can be manufactured. If a dispensational teacher allowed the 70 weeks to be acknowledged as a spiritual number, he would be left with nothing at all to give the appearance of biblical support for the doctrine of a seven-year tribulation. By insisting that each week is a seven-year period, and that Gabriel was not referring to the command that went out in the first year of Darius, and by relying on a complex manipulation of numbers and calendar systems, dispensational commentators are able to teach that when Christ was killed after the 69th week, God's time clock of the 70 weeks halted, and we could be kept on pause until the rapture of the church. After the rapture, the clock restarts for what dispensationalists call the 70th week of Daniel, the seven-year tribulation. If what we have observed in this video were to be widely acknowledged in the churches, the left-behind stories with all of the books and movies and sermons based on a seven-year tribulation would be exposed as science fiction. An entire industry would collapse. So, each of us has to choose whether to base our knowledge on what we can verify by direct observation in the scriptures or to base our knowledge on what someone is telling us about the scriptures. To base our knowledge on direct observation requires a lot of work, such as what we have done in this study. It's a lot easier to not put in the work and instead to be entertained by spectacular theological stories, such as the mass-marketed Left Behind series. In summary overall, First, we want to commend you for staying with a study that requires so much work and concentration. We have not even come close to learning all the details of this prophecy, and there are statements in the passage that I do not at this time know the meaning of. I could speculate, but in doing that, I would be moving off of solid ground. So I would rather bring a study that is limited and incomplete rather than one that incorporates imagination and tries to force through an interpretation that gives only an appearance of holding together. Right. There's much in the passage for which I cannot demonstrate the meaning, but I do know that dispensational manipulation of the passage to create the doctrine of a seven-year tribulation does not stand the test of sound reasoning 
or the transparent witness of Scripture. With that, my beloved wife and I urge you to search the Scriptures daily to put to the test yes. what you hear or read, even when it comes from your favorite teachers. Right. God bless you all. In God the name you. of the Lord Jesus Christ.